Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Bureau's Friday seminar. We're lucky to have our very own Dr. Todi Larson uh, speaking this morning, and he's a research scientist here at the BEG and PI of the Mudrock Systems Research Laboratory, research, uh, a research consortium. Uh, Todi received his PhD from the University of New Mexico in 2003 and was a postdoc research fellow at the University of Western Ontario in 2004. Prior to the BEG, uh, uh, prior to the BEG, Todi was a geochemistry team lead at Los Alamos Laboratory, where his research included carbon sequestration monitoring strategies, development of oil shell tracers in the Piacence, Piance. Piance Basin, uh, chemical and nuclear weapons forensics, wow, and uh, development of engineered zeolites. Todi was hired by the Department of Geological Sciences at UT Austin in 2011 where he developed stable isotope and gas chromatography experiments that targeted fugitive methane, the study of subsurface noble gas banks and CO2 carbon storage applications. In his role at the BEG, Todi's research focuses on subsurface reservoir characterization through the integration of core-based characterizations with wireline log response curves. Todi's research uses machine learning to integrate complex subsurface data sets to help define rock faces and upscale their attributes to the wireline and basin scale, which I think he's talking about today. So yeah, thanks, Brian. That, thanks, Toddy. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks for the inter uh, introduction. And thanks for helping uh, organize the uh, the technical seminar with uh, Priyanka. It's a, it's a great service and I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Uh, I obviously like really long titles. And so for the, uh, the sake of time, uh, I won't uh, reproduce the or say the title, uh, but what I think is really important here and what I want everyone to see in this talk is that we're building a workflow that's allowing us to integrate geological core studies with petrophysical studies. And that's allowing us to build better informed subsurface stratigraphic models. This is a, a rock faces approach that's uh, based on core. Uh, the data sets that we use to build these rocks or these uh, stratigraphic models are expansive and through machine learning, but more importantly, by building really well organized training data sets, we're able to better inform the subsurface characterizations than uh, we would otherwise. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done. We're by no means done with this, uh, but by using the, uh, the, uh, the workflow outlined here, every time that a new observation or a new measurement or a new facies is identified, we can add it to the training data set. And in that way, the training data set continually improves and our ability to uh, understand the uh, subsurface characterization improves. Uh, another part of this, and this is with having the, the core, we can use core across the basin that we've characterized to validate the model results. And that's extremely important in any of these machine learning uh, applications. That way we know where the model works. And I'd say almost more importantly, we know where the model fails. And when the model fails, we can actually learn something about that reservoir and we can go back and study it and uh, improve our understanding of the reservoir. So with that, I'll move on to the, uh, the talk. Let's see, there we go. So I've got three objectives that I wanna get across in this talk. Uh, the first is that we're trying to develop uh, core-based rock faces train data sets for the Wolf Camp and the Bone Spring in the Delaware Basin. Once that's accomplished, what we're doing is we're integrating core plug data. And that would be things like porosity, uh, mineralogy, and uh, total organic carbon into the facies model to downscale rock attributes. And this is a really important part. You get a lot of data about reservoir quality from core plug, but core plug's taken at a, at a low resolution. You know, it might be a foot, it might be three foot, or it might be five foot. But if you studied mud rocks, you understand that mud rocks are heterogeneous at the centimeter scale. So by incorporating the, the rock attribute data into the facies model, we're actually able to downscale the, um, the rock attribute data. And therefore we can build up higher resolution um, reservoir quality uh, maps or cross sections. And that would include things like porosity and uh, mineralogy. Uh, we're also upscaling. So we're trying to upscale core observations to the reservoir scale using the machine learning, and we're training wireline logs from the core-based rock faces. And that'll be the most of the results that I'll show here. The, the overarching project goal is to develop basin scale stratigraphic models from core studies for reservoir characterization. And essentially what we're doing is we're extending rock faces and rock attributes uh, beyond the core. That whole concept of using of extending core-based data to, to better understand reservoir quality is, is not new. Um, it's been something that's been done for a long time. And they use for an example, the work that Jerry Lucia did uh, back at his time in Shell and throughout his time in the uh, RCRL. He was able to use 
uh, take porosity permeability measurements and correlate them to either a rock fabric or a grain size distribution to essentially tie permeability and porosity to rock fabric and depositional systems and use this for um, spatial prediction uh, beyond the near bore. And you do this in carbonate systems. Extending this approach to mud rocks is difficult uh, to say the least. Uh, mud rocks, and I'll be careful, of course, I know there's, there's carbonate geologists and there's silicic classic geologists and there's mud rock geologists here. Um, mud rocks are very complicated. Uh, they're very difficult to characterize. Uh, and that's for a lot of reasons. One, they are mixed uh, carbonate silicic classic systems. So you're constantly kind of bouncing between uh, different classification schemes. Uh, the thin bed heterogeneity is real, you know, down to the centimeter scale heterogeneity of different facies. There's multiple depositional processes that are that are occurring simultaneously. You get sediment gravity flow deposits, bottom currents, um, sequence stratigraphy obviously does apply, Milankovitch cycles uh, apply. All those are happening kind of concurrently. And then they're affected by diagenesis. And diagenesis doesn't necessarily follow depositional systems. That's something that happens after burial. So there's a lot of overprinting effects that can happen with these facies. And that diagenesis can also affect proxy permeability and uh, rock mechanics studies. So mud rocks are, are very heterogeneous and they're very complex. And so trying to characterize mud rocks in a way that captures these uh, rock attributes is, is really difficult. And it's something that uh, we've been working on in the MSRL for over a decade. And it's something that we're continually uh, trying to improve our uh, ability to do it. But the goal here and kind of what we're getting at is that if we can tie core-based mudrock facies classifications to the rock attributes, that can provide us a path forward um, to successfully or hopefully successfully predict these rock facies uh, from wireline logs. And that's kind of what gets us that, that spatially expansive uh, approach. So the challenge here, <clears throat> really, there's many, I guess I'd say. Um, the challenges certainly fall under data integration is very difficult in this game and scaling is very difficult. The focus of this study is going to be kind of in this sort of this tens of to hundreds of meters to the, you know, I won't say 100 kilometers, but we're going from the core scale up into the basin scale. But there's a lot of important observations that have to be made down at the pore scale. And so there's a lot of work that's done. Uh, Rob Reed and Priyanka and Bob Laux spend a lot of their time uh, looking at, at pore characterization using scanning electron microscopy. And this gets us down to, you know, the nanometers. Pores that we can image are down to, you know, two nanometers to three nanometers is about the detection limit. But from the work that Tong Wei is doing in nitrogen absorption, we know that we have pores that are even less than that. So there's a lot of observations that have to be made at the nanometer scale. Uh, there's a lot of observations that need to be made kind of in the micron to centimeter scale through petrography. And there's, there's many, I don't spend my time working on this. You know, I'm fortunate to be able to work with experts in this, like Lucy Ko, who's able to do really good uh, petrography to help us understand the rock fabric and understand how that rock fabric kind of fits into the facey scheme. What I'm going to be talking about here is taking core-based data, extending it to wireline logs, and then using that to better inform uh, reservoir models. And so there's an enormous, I guess what I want to get across from here is there's an enormous amount of scaling from the nanometer to the hundreds of kilometers. Maybe another way to think about that and just kind of put it in different terms, when we're talking about pores that are you know, one to two nanometers, that's about the width of a uh, DNA helix. So these are very, very, these pores are tiny. I mean, they, they're absolutely tiny. I think a human hair is on the order of, of maybe 10 to 100 microns. So these pores are ex exceptionally small. Uh, the grain size that we're dealing with, uh, I've recently gotten into espresso and making espresso, so it's kind of my, my frame of reference these days on a lot of things. Uh, good ground espresso ranges from about 30 to 200 microns. Um, that's basically the size of a mud rocks or grains and mud rocks, kind of medium silt to fine silt size. And so we're trying to go from this scale to this scale, the reservoir scale, and you'll hear me talk a lot about Reeves County in the Delaware Basin. Reeves County is about 100 kilometers long, maybe 90 kilometers long. Um, it's about the distance from a drive from uh, Austin, Texas to uh, San Antonio. So this is an enormous scale. And the stratigraphic thickness that we're trying to interpret of the Wolf Camp and the Bone Spring, you're looking at the, the height of, of you know, skyscrapers in New York City or twice the size of uh, skyscrapers in uh, New York City. So there's a lot of scaling. You know, there's a lot of observations that are really, really important that we make through scanning electron microscopy down at the nanometer scale. But we're always trying to take this information and upscale it way up to the reservoir scale. And this is, you know, you're looking at 14 orders of magnitude 
of scaling that's essentially happening. The workflow that I'll get across here, um, like I said in the beginning, this is core-based. So we make a lot of core-based observations. Uh, we do this through core descriptions. We do a lot of high-resolution uh, XRF core scanning. We do this at the, the two-inch scale. Um, a lot of core plug measurements, that's where we get our rack attribute data, things like porosity and permeability, and finally wireline logs. There's, you know, we're working more on this now, and it's a subtlety here, but it's really important to think about. With scaling, or with rock faces, these are basically discrete measurements. You're looking at, at some physical thing in the rock, and it might have a thickness of a centimeter, it may have a thickness of a meter, but it's a discrete sort of body in the rock. Um, those are discrete measurements. When you get to the wireline log measurements, now you have these continuous measurements. You know, it's, it's averaging the effect of much larger volumes. And so when you're thinking about upscaling, how do you upscale a discrete object? You know, if, if you, and I like to say it this way, if you've got, you know, if you've got a mudstone that's next to a sandstone, you can't average it out and call it a siltstone. You have two very different discrete bodies. And so there's a lot of work in science that still needs to be done, kind of understanding how we incorporate this high resolution um, thin bed discrete data into these more continuous models uh, that we gain from a wireline log. We're going to talk a lot about machine learning. Um, machine learning, really, the, in my opinion of it, the, um, the hardest part about it is the data wrangling. It's organizing the data sets into training data sets. You spend a ridiculous amount of time doing it, but it's fundamentally important. Building the training data sets is what I'll talk about too today. This is where the geologists come in. This is where the domain experts are, are required. Um, this is what gets us into supervised uh, training and away from unsupervised training. And so we'll talk a little bit about cluster analysis, probability analysis. And that's another thing to think about with machine learning. You're not saying, your, your prediction is not telling you what the rock is. The prediction is telling you the probability that it's that facies or another facies. And so it's really, a, it's a, a probability study. Uh, the application, of course, is going to be into facies prediction, uh, building out better stratigraphic frameworks, and ultimately reservoir characterization is where this gets into. I bend, well, I use a lot of different types of software. There's no one piece of software that does everything. Um, and if I can't find something that works, then I code it myself. And so I've built a series of codes called CorePy. Um, you can go to my GitHub account and grab it there. Not everything is up to date there, but anytime I have something that's really specific that I just can't gain from one of the you know, commercial software packages, I sort of build it, but then I make it so that it can always be exported into any of the, the uh, commercial software. Okay, we'll go to the, uh, the, the field area. So we're gonna be talking about the Delaware Basin and that's shown over here. So we're, we have a, the main field area that we're gonna be looking at. Well, I guess if you're not familiar with the Delaware Basin, uh, this is in West Texas and it's between the, uh, the Central Basin platform, kind of bounds it to the uh, east and the Diablo platform, the Northwest Shelf off to the, uh, the west. So if you've been out to the Guadalupes, you're off on the west side of the Delaware Basin. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of oil and gas production that's happening and has been happening for the past decade in the Delaware Basin and continues to go forward. And so we're going to be studying about the Delaware Basin. In particular, we're going to be looking at this cross section from uh, Eddy County in New Mexico down across Loving County into Reeves County. Um, we have a separate project that we're doing that Lucy Coe has been working on uh, more closely that's looking at the transition from what we call sort of northern Delaware Basin into southern Delaware Basin. There's a, a dramatic facies shift that happens down here. Um, and this is just give one example of where it's one model doesn't solve the whole thing. So the model I'm gonna be talking about is more focused on this sort of Northern Delaware Basin section here. Everywhere you see the, the black dots on here, uh, that's where we've had um, wireline logs that we've picked formation tops. So that's one data set. Everywhere you see the, the red circles in here, uh, that's where we have triple combo. The, the facies model that I'm running is running off triple combo. And so we have about 240 uh, triple combos in the model. And from the 240 uh, through QAQC, we're using about 170 of them uh, right now. We can always add more. And we do add more as companies give us additional data. Uh, the core, I've not, I'm not showing for proprietary reasons, but we have six core that are crossing the uh, WolfCamp XY and five core that are crossing uh, WolfCamp AMB. And this is really important because again, a model is just a model. It's gonna, it's gonna always make a prediction. But how you validate that model and know that that model is working is the most important part. And so we can do that by the chord intervals that we have across this uh, um, field area. So every time we run the model, we can bracket the, um, the cross section you know, on its north end and the south end by chord intervals. 
and look to see how well the wireline log model is predicting based on core observations. So that's a model validation. Here's a type log. This is from uh, Reeves County, uh, right up in this area here, uh, north of the Grisham Fault. And this is just here to, to show the breakouts of how we call the, the tops of you know, Wolf Camp C, uh, Wolf Camp B, uh, Wolf Camp A. XY, I put within Wolf Camp A. But what it's showing here with these, these red boxes are the, the two models um, that we have. So we have two formation models. And I should have said that up front. These are formation specific models. So there's not one kind of wireline log model that runs across everything. We break down to the formation scale. And I think that's really important. Um, but we're doing a combination now. We're, we're building one model that we run across the third bone spring sand and Wolf Camp XY. There's a lot of facey similarities between those. And then we have a second model that we run across uh, Wolf Camp A and Wolf Camp B, uh, just to the top of Wolf Camp C. Uh, we don't do much in Wolf Camp C. There hasn't been a lot of interest. I mean, Wolf Camp C is interesting. There hasn't been a lot of uh, oil and gas interest in uh, Wolf Camp C. There is a lot of renewed interest in Wolf Camp D. And so we have a separate model that we're running for that one. And that's uh, ongoing research. Okay, let's talk a little bit about depositional systems. This is a slide that was put together and presented by, um, it was a presentation by myself, uh, Jesse Mellick at uh, BPX and Evan Civil here, and we presented it at WTGS. And this was basically our approach to kind of bring everything together and try to think about depositional systems, uh, lithophases, and uh, rock attributes. And so what we have here is we broke up into, um, if you're looking over on this side where you see like the yellows and the greens, this is when we're in siliciclastic dominated systems. And if you're looking over on this side over here, and you're seeing the sort of the blue hues and the teals, that's where we're in, we're in um, carbonate dominated systems. And then we'll talk about these drift modified deposits uh, next. And so uh, the, the Delaware Basin is, is complex and there's a lot of depositional systems, but one of the, the more important kind of mechanisms of transporting uh, deposits into the basin are through these uh, um, uh, mass transport complexes. And so hybrid event beds, essentially in turbidite complexes. Uh, more specifically. And so with hybrid event beds, they're, they've been described by Houghton and uh, Eric Cavalli and others have used it to describe some of the depositional processes across Wolf Camp A and uh, B and into the third bone spring sand. They're basically hybrid in that they have both cohesive and non-cohesive uh, flow properties, but they, they, they result in a uh, predictable uh, stacking pattern of facies. And so working from the bottom in a, in a silicic dominated system, you typically have uh, uh, more siltstones and sandstones, kind of clean, uh, co non-cohesive flow deposits at the bottom. And that moves upward or finds upward into more clay dominated systems as you work towards the top. Uh, the scale of these can be, are variable, um, less than three feet, certainly upwards of 15 feet. So there's a tremendous difference in scale, but you do tend to get this sort of predictable uh, distribution of, of uh, lithophases uh, from the bottom of one of these to the top of one of these. What's interesting and important is the, the distribution of any one of these facies varies whether you're proximal or distal to the, um, the, the fan complex. And so if you're proximal to the fan complex, you can get a really nice buildup of the base of these, these sort of basal uh, sandstones. But if you're distal, then those, ba those basal sandstones can be very thin and is more dominated by the uh, mud dominated systems. Thinking in terms of, of uh, rock attributes, porosity, clay content, TOC, and brittleness, uh, we just made some schematics. This is cartoon, but overall the trends are, uh, are accurate where you can see a um, porosity decrease from the bottom to the top of one of these things. Clay content increases from the bottom to the top. Organic carbon content increases to the top and uh, uh, brittleness uh, decreases up towards the top. Working over to the uh, carbonate dominated systems, and these are more typical of Wolf Camp A and B, although you do see them in Wolf Camp X and sometimes in Third Bone Spring Sand. These are basically the debrites and the, the carbonate uh, hybrid event beds and, turbid and uh, turbidites. Real similar stacking pattern, but very different mineralogy. So working with kind of, if you're in the Dunham classification, you know, wacky stones and pack stones down on the bottom, working up into uh, calcareous mud rocks into the top. Overall, the trends are similar uh, with the main difference being the porosity. 
uh, porosity increases going to the top in these carbonate dominated systems generally. And that's ultimately because these just get calcite cemented during diagenesis in the bottom. So you lose a lot of the, um, uh, the porosity down here. You gain a lot of porosity up here, but this is more clay dominated porosity. So it's a pretty complex uh, system. Uh, and then finally, we'll get into these two facies right here. These are drift modified deposits. And these are essentially the, if you looked at third bone spring sand, we're interpreting them as drift modified deposits. These are those pinstriped uh, sandstones and siltstones that um, you see frequently in the third bone spring sand. And you definitely see it if you work over in the Midland Basin and the Sprayberry. And then finally, this clay shale. And that's something that has developed certainly in Wolf Camp C, but we see uh, a lot of development of it in the base of a uh, Wolf Camp B. And so basically what I wanna get across is that we're working within this depositional system. We have this sort of mechanism of how sediment's getting transported in the basin. And as we build out our facies, we're not just doing it with chemistry or wireline, that we're doing it from the lithophases uh, breakout. Okay, what the rocks look like. <clears throat> this is two uh, different uh, hybrid event beds. This is these three kind of core tubes here. These are uh, three foot lengths, by the way. So this is nine feet of core here. This is another nine feet of core here. Uh, this is a silicic classic dominator system. This is from the, uh, the East Romeo core up in uh, Ward County. And this is from a uh, carbonate dominated system. And I just wanted to do this to kind of show kind of what the heterogeneity is and how we're breaking these out into this. Um, I didn't mention it too much. The, the description that uh, Houghton had that was modified by Cavalli, breaking these hybrid event beds into this, this predictable sequence of H1 to H2, H3, finally H3 upper on the top. And there's a lot of rock fabric that, um, that you can use to interpret uh, where you are in the, um, in the depositional system. So H1 typically look like these, these massive sandstones or siltstones that you see down at the base. H3 lower to H3 upper is a distinction that Eric Cavalli made based on grain size and clay content. And what you can see is a really complex uh, fabric of uh, dewatering structures, kind of convolute patterns, kind of sigmoidal patterns. There's a lot of shear that's developed up in here. And then you get a lot of clay rich intervals up to the top. And then finally you get to this pinstriped interval up here. This is a particularly dark one. Um, oftentimes they're very light, but it's like all things in geology, there's, it's not one or the other. There's this continuum between. Uh, working over the carbonate system, it looks a lot like the silicic classic system except for it's calcite rather than uh, quartz. And so again, here's the base of one of these uh, hybrid event beds, kind of working up into a, um, a, you know, this sort of H3 lower unit here. So what I want to get across here is that this is what the rocks look like. We can characterize them based on depositional systems, and we can use that classification to kind of inform our uh, facies model. And then finally, you know, wouldn't be complete talking about Delaware Basin without talking about um, debrites or carbonate class supported debrites. Um, this is what they look like. This is really hard to characterize using uh, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, we do run XRF uh, across this to characterize it, and I'll describe that in a little bit. Um, but you don't necessarily need XRF to identify that's a, a debrite. You can, you can see it, and you can pick it out in a wireline uh, quite easily. But with additional information that we get from XRF, what we can do is we can actually characterize the matrix within these debrites. And that's a really important thing with these debrites. Some of them are grain-supported. Some of them are matrix-supported. And so there's a lot of difference in the, the way they behave and the way they can store oil and gas. So it's important to characterize those uh, nonetheless. And then finally, this is what the, um, the drift modified deposits look like. Here's the clay mudstones that dominate uh, Wolf Camp C and the lower parts of Wolf Camp B. And this is a better picture of what these, um, the pinstripe siltstones look like in the um, third bone spring sand uh, shown here. It's this horizontally laminated, it's it, Rob Reed's doing work on this at the SEM scale to better understand the, um, the horizontal laminations. We're trying to, to better characterize these, to think of them in terms of uh, potential water saturation problems. Um, but overall, it's a, it's a dominant facies uh, throughout the um, third bone spring sand. And then finally, there's a lot of bioturbation as well. And so here's a nice uh, bioturbated interval right here. So what I'm trying to get across from here is that Wolf Camp and third bone spring sand is complex. Another form of <clears throat> Uh, data collection is high resolution x-ray fluorescence. So if you look at core that we've studied, every two inches you see a sticker. Everywhere where we stickered it, we have uh, XRF. And that XRF can give you the elemental concentrations of up to 30 elements. Uh, we work on about 26 of them. There's four of them that are uh, pretty spurious. Um, but we have a, a lot of high resolution uh, XRF that we can use to better characterize the core. And this is what gets us into that sort of the data analytics side. These are enormous data sets that you're trying to interrogate 
and do more than just kind of plot univariant curves. And then we have core plug data. And the core plug is where you get the reservoir properties. That's X-ray diffraction, uh, shale rock property, porosity permeability, uh, triaxial measurements, uh, TOC measurements on it. What we've done recently to try to incorporate the core plug data into our facies model is everywhere we can find core plug, we XRF it. And by doing that, we can now figure out or, or predict, I guess is a better uh, scientific term to use, predict what facies that core plug comes from. And so that's how we integrate core plug data into our facies model. And so if, if we're lucky and we have the core plugs, then we XRF the core plugs and we build it into our facies model. If we don't have the actual core plug, we go back to the core and XRF right next to where that core plug was taken. And then we use that to kind of build in this, this whole facies model. And so this is all part of that sort of integrative approach of bringing in the core plug data, bringing in the XRF, bringing in the lithophases. Everyone loves chemistry, so you gotta show the periodic table. Um, just to highlight <clears throat> with XRF, you do get 30 elements, uh, 10 major, 20 trace elements. Um, we do this, it takes about two minutes. We, I don't do this. Uh, we, I'm very fortunate to have a, a team of people who, and students who have who've done this over the past decade. Um, none of this would be possible without the, the work they put into uh, to doing this. And this is uh, championed by uh, Evan Civil uh, here at the BEG. So you can get a lot of chemistry data from this. What I'm gonna focus on here is how we build chemophases or facies classification based on chemical correlations. And this goes beyond just using elemental proxies Although there's a lot of work that you can do to use the sort of elemental data, the trace element data to interpret depositional systems, we're going to focus on taking all the XRF data and building out chemophases. And that's what gets us into, let me close that there. <clears throat> so this is going to get us into the machine learning side of it. Um, with machine learning, there's in classifications, there's really two classes here. There's unsupervised and supervised. Uh, unsupervised can be really uh, powerful, and I kind of started in this game using uh, principal component analysis and k-means clustering. The advantage of unsupervised is that it's non-biased, and so you're just exploring data sets and you're looking for correlations um, that exist that you may not otherwise uh, be able to find. Problem with unsupervised classifications is that it's independent of geological principles. You're just using correlations in the data set. You're not implying your own sort of geological knowledge to better build out um, facies. Jumping into supervised classifications and everything I'm gonna present here is supervised. Supervised requires training data sets. Um, the importance with this is that now you can start bringing in the geological principles and that's the lithophases. And that's where those core descriptions get so important. We wanna build chemophases that honor kind of geological um, principles, but also honor sort of the rock attribute data. I like to say this though, because there's, you know, on the, um, on the statistics side and the machine learning side, you know, I always say garbage in, garbage out. Absolutely, that's true. With supervised classifications, you are now biasing the system. You're using your preconceived notions to build it. That can be right or that can be wrong. And so I do think it's still important to go through on these unsupervised classifications, just to look to see if there's something you missed. Is there a data set you missed? Is there a correlation you missed? Is there something you ignored? And if you stick with just doing this based on preconceived ideas, you're not gonna grow and kind of add new observations. Um, all that said, I found we've had great results incorporating or integrating kind of core facies that we make, paper and pencil, with all the elemental data to build out this more integrated um, kind of facies trained data set. Okay. We'll get a little into the chemistry and so kind of two slides that are going to highlight just some of the um, some of the results kind of what it looks like what you're seeing here is results from third bone spring sand and wolf camp xy this is the xrf data plotted on four different kind of bivariate plots so for example silicon versus aluminum or nickel versus aluminum and i just plot this to show the sort of distributions and the elemental trends that exist in these facies and we use this to better kind of describe the facies and so, for example, the yellow up here, that's the sandy siltstone, silicon rich. So it's got the silica excess. And if you look at sort of the, the purples and the pinks down here, these are these uh, dolomitic siltstones or do dolomitic mudstones. A better way to identify the dolomitic mudstones is you could look at magnesium versus calcium. And you can see that we're pinning and looking for a really high magnesium uh, rock facies. Uh, in a carbonate system, you can see uh, carbonate class supported debrites 
These are these really calcium rich ones, but then there's a trend down into the blues over here that's going into the calcareous mudstones. One thing just to take home from this is that there are no fixed lines in this. There's not, you know, if you work in just sharp cutoffs across the board, that's not how geology works. Geology is continuous. And so it should be expected that we'd have these trends that will go from, you know, carbonate class supported debrites into calcareous mudstones. You're not going to expect just a sharp break down the middle of it. But also we can use the interpretations of say um, trace elements like nickel and uh, molybdenum to identify nutrient rich zones. So these are, we would predict these would be uh, TOC rich intervals because they're um, preserving uh, uh, nickel and they're preserving molybdenum. And so there's a lot that you can take out of this, but this is one of the trained data sets that we've built out. And this is our uh, facies that we're working on or we've defined for third bone spring sand and wolf camp XY. And this is what it looks like when we plot it. So we're going back to those same, the, the, uh, the Houghton diagram of the siliciclastic dominated HEBs and that core description. But now what we can do is everywhere where we have that two inch uh, XRF sticker, we have a predicted facies. And so this is one of the validation tools we can use. You know, is our, is our train data set working? Is our model working? For every core that we have, we can plot out the facies on top of it and we can look exactly at how it's predicting it and we can modify the, um, the train data set as we go. And so this is one example here <clears throat> for, the, um, for the third bone spring sand and the um, uh, wolf camp XY. One thing to note here that's really important is that in this, um, this lower section, this H1 of this hybrid event bed, this is typically a really high porosity uh, interval. And you can see that where the, um, the silt stones are down here in yellow, but you're seeing these purples uh, up here. This is where that silt stone has been dolomitized. And so through diagenesis, you essentially took what could have been an incredible reservoir and just destroyed the processing and permeability by infilling it with dolomite. And so through the XRF work and through our, our chemofaces model, uh, we can predict where those um, dolomitized uh, intervals are. So that goes a long way towards better understanding uh, reservoir quality. Go through the same exercise, but we're gonna switch over to uh, Wolf Camp AB. There we're focused on carbonate dominated systems. And so you see the colors here going from blues to teals and the darks. So the, the dark here would be the TOC rich mudstone. That was that one that was nickel dominated and molybdenum dominated. You can see it up here. <clears throat> so similar trend to what we saw in the, um, in the third bone spring sand. Um, the dolomitic intervals here shown in purple. These are dolomites in the, in the carbonate system. So just want to get across that we have a sort of a logical organized approach to call out the facies uh, through these uh, formations. Doing the same exercise, now we can look at the, at the core photographs and we can directly put on top of that the chemofacies predictions and we can see you know, what, the, you know, what we're predicting as this, um, the carbonate mudstone, what that actually looks like, what the, um, the sort of wacky stone, pack stone and Dunham classification, what that looks like, and we can modify our model uh, based on this and we can validate our model results using uh, chord intervals. I want to note, this is all based on XRF data so far. We're going to transition the talk into um, wireline predictions coming up. <clears throat> I guess before we do that, let's do one last thing. Let's talk about rock attributes. So I mentioned XRFing the uh, core plug data. And so we've put in all the core plug data into our chemofaces model. And so now what that's let us do is we can talk about chemofaces. And so these would be our chemofaces for third bone spring sand and wolf camp XY. And we can describe them statistically in terms of rock attributes that matter for reservoir quality. So things like total organic carbon, uh, total porosity, and water saturation. And so we don't want to describe chemofaces just based on nickel enrichment or molybdenum enrichment. We want to describe them uh, with respect to uh, reservoir quality. And we can think of, of how the... Um, you know, the porosity and the clay content TLC is going to vary in, across these depositional systems. And we can do the same thing for the wolf camp, thinking in terms of the depositional system, but describing the facies with respect to TOC, um, total porosity, and water saturation. We can do this with any of the attributes that we measure, and I just selected these here because this is part of a project we're working on with a few companies. <clears throat> so with that, what we can do is we now have this integrated core facies model. We can build out high resolution stacking patterns of the facies. We can compare them to um, rock classifications we've made from core. And then we can assign reservoir characteristics for each of the facies, whether it's like a, a cemented reservoir, so it'd be poor for a reservoir, whether there's it's great source rock potential, 
um, high storage permeability and porosity. And so you can see how we can take the reservoir quality and start looking at the, at the stratigraphic stacking pattern in terms of reservoir quality. And so this is great. This is a huge advance for us. And you know, this is a, a, an example of how we've kind of used all this data to build out this, this uh, FACES model. And what we're gonna do next now is take the core data and move it away from the core and try to expand it across the basin. And this is that upscaling uh, technique. I left out <clears throat> where the core intervals are on here, but we have a total of 11 core. And so everywhere that our model gets run, we're basing it on either end from core. And that's how we validate the core model. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna train the wireline logs uh, from the core intervals and we're using triple combo. And so the numbers I've got here, so triple combo is uh, gamma ray deep resistivity, neutron porosity and bulk density. There's a total of 170 cores or uh, wireline logs that are in here. And we've got two models, one for the third sand XY and the other for uh, Wolf Camp AB. And so this is what we're trying to get to. You know, our, our common view of the reservoir is through wireline logs. So we could look at gamma ray and resistivity and that's great. And there's a lot of information that you can gain. But what we can do is we can train these wireline logs and start to predict uh, facies patterns across it. And so essentially what we're adding is a third column. So you have one column that would be gamma ray, one column that would be resistivity, and another column that will be the predicted facies from the core. And that's what this column is right here. And these just happen to be two wireline logs in Reeves County that are uh, a couple of kilometers away from each other. And you can see overall, just sort of connecting the lines between, you know, there's overall good agreement of where that clay shale is in, um, in gray down at the bottom. You can clearly see where we're transitioning from Wolf Camp A into Wolf Camp Y, and then into Wolf Camp X. And you can see that Wolf Camp Y is, is capped by these calcareous mudstones in blue. Wolf Camp X is also capped by these calcareous mudstones in blue. And there's a real shift in the mudstone type as you go into third bone spring sand. You see a lot of the yellows, those are those uh, quartz siltstones, but then you see a lot of the greens and those are, are more uh, argillaceous, uh, siliceous mudstones. And so this is just an example for two. I'll go through some of the techniques we use for the, um, the machine learning to train the wireline logs, but then we'll get into the bigger basin kind of cross sections to, to look at. So what a training data set looks at, you know, I don't want to show, you never show tables, but we're going to show a table. Essentially what we've got is this, this formation specific integrated training data set where all the data is in one giant table and all the data includes the depth corrections, all the, the chemostratigraphy, uh, the elemental concentrations, all the rock attributes, all the wireline logs that have been resampled at the XRF uh, core depths. That's a whole separate talk of how we do that, but we have to resample all the wireline logs where we have XRF data and core. If you're interested in that, I can talk about that offline. And then they're isotopically labeled. So that's what a supervised training data set is. And this is what we're building out. The, I've used a, a variety of, of uh, machine learning models for classification. Uh, the one that I keep centering on and the one that I have the, the best success with is the uh, a neural model. We have, uh, there's basically two separate neural models that run uh, with the input values being either the elemental concentrations from XRF or the wireline log response from wireline logs. The targets or what we're trying to hit are the facies. And so this would be an example of a neural model running with five facies. So again, this is formation specific. So it's depending on how many facies we classify for uh, each model. But what you gotta get used to is the fact that you're, you're predicting the probability that it is that facies, not saying it's that facies. And so there's a lot of information that can be used in the statistics here to not only gain information about how good that facies model is, but where your facies are starting to get confused. And so there's a, a ton of statistics that can be done kind of on the backside of this. Just for model validation, what it finally looks like, <clears throat> you can use a confusion matrix to, to validate your model. And you can look at precision and recall to understand how well the facies model is working. This is an example of a eight facies model that we've run. And what I just wanna highlight here is some of the tools you can use in machine learning to, to understand where your model's failing and where your model's overlapping. So this is a confusion matrix. What you really wanna see is all really high numbers across this diagonal. And that is when the actual, that's the, the trained data set, agrees with what you predicted it. So in this particular case, for these, uh, the purple, that's the dolomitic mudstones, uh, 21 times it, it predicted what it actually is, but 17 times it predicted it was something else. It was a pretty poor fit. And you can see this is zero, one, two, three. This is number three. So we're only getting 46% 46 precision, 46 precision here. It's pretty bad. 
but you can see what it's overlapping with. It's overlapping with the facies that I termed as that um, dolomitic uh, siltstone. What I was trying to do from the rock facies data was break out dolomite in mudstones, dolomite in siltstones. The wire line is just not uh, distinguishing those two. And so there's, there's one of two things you can do here. You can either just decide like, okay, the wire line does not have the capacity to distinguish those two, and maybe that's fine. But at least you've got the ability to look back at the model and understand where the overlap is. And so that's one of the tools um, you can use to kind of validate the model. So here's one run that we've done from one core, a one core interval. What you're looking at here is the chemofaces that were predicted based on the XRF data. That's this track right here I call a rock class. So this is the, the true per se. So this is faces from the core. This track right here are faces that are predicted from my trained wireline logs. And so at, at first glance, even with the glasses on, you can see that there's really good agreement between the overall uh, stratigraphic um, stacking that we're seeing here and the ability for the wireline log model to correctly predict faces um, that, um, from the trained data set. There's a little loss in resolution. And so, for example, you can see down here, you know, this clay shale in, in gray, we're just seeing, you know, we're not seeing some of that thin bed heterogeneity that exists down here. I think that's okay. And in fact, this is what we're predicting from the wireline log is still too high resolution. We're still at that six inch interval. And one of the goals from this is to build out bigger stratigraphic models, geocellular models from this. And so we're gonna have to, to upscale this uh, even more to get to that sort of one and a half foot to three foot kind of scale. So there's still a lot of upscaling that has to be done. But what this is showing is that we've got an approach to go from core facies to, to predicted wireline facies. And again, this is stacked up, this is two separate models. This model was run on this wireline log for the wolf camp down here. And then we ran it again on the uh, third bone spring XY uh, up here. Okay, so what we're trying to get to is this. Here's a cross section, <clears throat> it's an 80 mile cross section. So yeah, about just over hundred kilometers uh, going from uh, Eddy County in New Mexico down through uh, Ward County and down through uh, Reeves County and then we're crossing the Grisham Fault. Here's the you know, typical way of looking at things, gamma ray resistivity logs here with the, uh, the formation top breakouts. We've run the model from the top of Wolf Camp C to the top of Third Bone Spring Sand. And so what you're seeing here, and this is just, this is not datum done any formation, this is just actual depth. <clears throat> so you're looking at a structural cross section across the Delaware Basin from north to south, uh, looking at the facies breakout predicted from wireline log that are trained on our cord intervals. So this is sort of the, the, the one of the final products here. And what we'll do in the, in the next slides is we'll datum this and start looking at kind of how we can um, better interpret uh, depositional systems based on the facies. And so <clears throat> we're gonna work, here's our, our field area here going from Eddy County down into Ward County. We are south of the Grisham Fault, but we're not getting into, um, into uh, Pecos County yet. That's the work with, uh, that I'm doing with Lucy Co and some operators to um, build out our model uh, better down in this uh, Pecos County. There's a big facies transition that does happen. Uh, well, maybe not big, but importantly subtle, maybe is a way to say it. So we're gonna uh, uh, work in this field area here. And we have a series of cross sections just to show um, the stratigraphic results. Here's an isopac map. Uh, showing the Wolf Camp A. And just to note here, this is where you have this big sort of uh, uh, carbonate complex, uh, Deborite complex, building out from uh, Lee County, making its way into um, Ward and into um, uh, Reeves County. I'm sorry, Loving and uh, Reeves County. And here's a few other ice pack maps just to kind of give some reference. I guess starting, let's be geologists today and start with the uh, bottom and work up. So looking at the, um, the ice pack map, and this is just a gross isopac map for uh, Wolf Camp Y. And so our cross section is just gonna go just off to the sort of the west side of this thing where the, the thickness, the total thickness of it is up here in Lee County, but we're still crossing a pretty thick interval, but we're gonna be going from kind of the thickest intervals of Wolf Camp Y down distal where Wolf Camp Y basically doesn't exist. And then we'll do the same thing for Wolf Camp X, starting from the north, working our way down to the south across the, these, uh, the grains here, are uh, 60 to 70 foot kind of thickness intervals. And then finally working south of the Grisham Fault into the blues where it, Wolf Camp X essentially goes away. And then third bone spring sand, working up section, again, thickest to the north, and it does extend quite a bit down to the south. And so we do have data uh, in the facies model for third bone spring sand all the way down into um, just near the Pecos uh, County line. 
So this is that same uh, north to south uh, cross section. And we're just going to kind of step through different datums. So this is flattened on Wolf Camp B2 shown here. So first thing of interest, I think that's our first thing that you can see here is just the development of this clay wedge up in uh, Eddy County in uh, northern New Mexico. So it's this huge development of this clay wedge. This light gray are the, the clay rich uh, chemofaces. And working to the south towards the Grisham Fault, it certainly still extends, but it becomes more interbedded with the blues which are the calcareous mudstones and the, um, the sort of debrites and uh, calcareous hybrid event beds. And so you can see another big development of that clay wedge kind of working our way towards the, uh, the Grisham Shale. And then again, it gets much more dispersed as you work off to the south. So it's, it's up here that it just, it's, it's enormous. Um, below and in Wolf Camp C, it is, there's certainly some targets. Uh, generally the good targets in the uh, Wolf Camp are the calcareous mudstones. Um, and you can see the development of a lot of calcareous mudstones in Wolf Camp C uh, throughout Eddy and into, I got this wrong, actually, this is not Texas Ward County, this is Loving County. Um, so the calcareous mudstones down into um, Loving County, finally going into the dark colors here, which are the TOC rich mudstones. So there's a facies transition that's happening, working from here to here. We can tease that information out based on this kind of core based approach. Uh, let's move up a step. So now we're datumed on top of Wolf Camp B. You can still really nicely see that clay wedge kind of developed, but you can see just in these, these teal colors here, these are typically the, the um, debrites. So you can see really nice development of the debrites up in uh, Eddy County to the north, sort of thinning as we make our way down into Loving County. But then you're picking up more of these debrites as you're, you're working your way down into um, Southern Loving County into uh, Reeves County. So a lot of uh, stratigraphic architecture, a lot of complexity. Uh, working to the south, you can see this, this development of another deb right here. But ultimately what you're seeing with um, uh, Wolf Camp A is just this, this high resolution alternation from calcareous mudstones shown in blue, some TOC rich mudstones shown in the dark colors, and then going to the, the teals, which are the sort of the bases of either these hybrid event beds or these deb rights. So a lot of stratigraphic architecture kind of um, that you can tease out now with the facies. Moving up now, we'll datum it on top of, of the um, Wolf Camp X or the base of the Third Bone Spring Sand. And, you know, this, this whole project started out in the Third Bone Spring Sand. And I think that there's, I'm, I have a lot of interest in the Third Bone Spring Sand. There's a lot of architecture that we're teasing out of this that I think is gonna be really important. Let's start from the bottom. You can see Wolf Camp Y kind of snaking its way through. Uh, pretty big development of Wolf Camp Y in the southern part of Eddy County, uh, northern part of uh, Loving County, uh, and even in the, the, this section of Loving County, but then really petering out as we make our way down into the um, Grisham Shear Zone to essentially just uh, being discontinuous. Uh, Wolf Camp X, though, is built up quite nicely. Thickest portion of Wolf Camp X shown here in um, Ward County. The yellows are the high porosity siltstones. What's important and a real important distinction between Wolf Camp XY and third bone spring sand, and an importance that probably dictates the, uh, the production potential for both of these reservoirs, is that you can see the top of Wolf Camp X is dominated by these calcareous mudstones. These are typically TOC rich. They have a very different behavior than the, the facies that you see here in green, which are more the siliceous argillaceous mudstones, they have lower TOC. And so in the, in the Wolf Camp X and Y sort of stacked reservoir, you got really high porosity uh, siltstones, that are capped by these calcareous mudstones with high TOC that makes a good uh, self-sourcing potential, uh, potentially a good sealing uh, potential uh, between XY and the third bone spring sand. Moving up, so think of these as, as benches. Here's the first siltstone, the second siltstone, here's the third siltstone. And what you're seeing at the base, the sort of basal unit of the third bone spring, really nice siltstone development down here. And then working our way into um, kind of towards the Grisham Fault you can see this facey shift from just really clean siltstones to the north, going to where you're getting more and more of these siliceous argillaceous mudstones uh, kind of uh, intersecting or, or um, interbedded with the siltstones as we make our way to the south. And so one would expect the behavior of this third sand down here to be very different than the behavior of the third sand up here. This lower bench of the third sand is capped by this, this siliceous argillaceous mudstone shown here in green. And you can see it kind of trending its way down here and then there's just that, that whole facies transition to include much more interbedded uh, siliceous argillaceous mudstones uh, continues through the, the, out the uh, D 
the entire uh, third bone spring sand. I think another thing that's important, and I highlighted it earlier, these pinks and these purples, those are the dolomitized siltstones. Anytime you're going to have a dolomitized siltstone, it's going to take your reservoir rock and just drop the porosity from what it was kind of in that sort of 12% to 10% range down to about 2% or 1%. And so it's going to be a very different behavior in the, in the reservoir. And from this model, we do predict some of those uh, dolomitized siltstones down at the base, but we see a lot of those dolomitized siltstones uh, much higher up in section. And we also see a lot of those dolomitized siltstones sort of forming down here. Um, so it's a tool to take an observation from the core to better inform the stratigraphic stacking and then use that to better inform the, the reservoir. And that's, that's the ultimate goal for this whole project. Uh, just one more cross-section to think in terms of uh, <clears throat> going from uh, east to west. This again is datumed on top of the, um, or the base of the third bone spring sand. And what we just want to show, here's the Wolf Camp Y uh, gross isopack. And we're, we're basically working from uh, well on the eastern side of Loving County all the way into uh, Culberson County over here. And it's just pretty interesting to me. I mean, you can see like the Wolf Camp Y, really nice development in this section right here at the, at the county line um, between Loving and, um, and Reeves, but then just petering out as you move off the um, off it. And so that's gonna be that, that, that petering out is essentially that facing shift from siltstones to, to mudstones. And you see a really nice development of uh, X and then it gets a little uh, janky for um, third bone spring sand. But again, at the base, you can see there's a really nice development of third bone spring sand reservoir at the base, but a much different uh, uh, reservoir in the upper sections of the third sand. So to conclude, you know, we've got two models that we've run, one for uh, Wolf Camp AB, one for XY. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, predictable capability that's coming out of this. And I think we've been able to show that we've been able to take a core-based facies model and use that to train wireline log suites. I chose gamma ray resistivity, um, neutron porosity, and uh, bulk density in part because I had access to a lot of those data sets. But that was one of the questions that was asked from some of our operators, like how far can you extend the use of these uh, wireline logs? We can train them on all and any wireline log we want. So there's a lot of models that can be run. But I think we've taken a nice approach to take core observations, interpret depositional systems, model the wireline logs, and then inform the reservoir model. This is just one example of a study we're doing in the, um, in the Delaware Basin, but we've got related studies that are ongoing right now. Uh, Evan Civil is working on his uh, master's thesis, looking at the uh, lower Eagleford. So he's taking this exact same approach and looking at the lower Eagleford from DeWitt County over into uh, Carnes County, that influence of the sort of East Texas Eagleford with uh, South Texas Eagleford. <clears throat> uh, Charlie Neal is working on his PhD and he's taken uh, rock facies from the Austin Chalk and modeling it across uh, Webb County and uh, Dimmitt County. Uh, we have another project that we're doing that's looking at um, this over in the Midland Basin. We're taking our Wolf Camp AB model and we're adding a Wolf Camp D model and then looking at some of the sprayberry uh, mud rock intervals. And so the idea, of course, is to, to inform these types of cross sections. So this is one cross section going up and over the, uh, the Glasscock nose from the, the Eastern Shelf down in the basin. And then everywhere you see the red circles here, that's where we have XRF data in the Haynesville. And so we're gonna take the same approach and do this for the Haynesville. And so with that, I have a lot to thank. There's you know, a lot of this, I'm at an advantage. I came into the MSRL and a lot of the, the, the beginnings of this research were done. A lot of the data collection was done. And through the machine learning that I brought in, I was able to, to maybe better orchestrate some of this to get to this facies prediction side but in no way would any of this have been able to be accomplished without the work that had been done uh, throughout the MSRL. Uh, and of course, our uh, consortium sponsors helped fund this along with the Bureau of Economic Geology. And so I thank everyone for the, um, you know, providing the data, providing the ideas and uh, helping out with the research. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you. Great, thank you, Teddy. Uh, we've got time for some questions. So maybe we'll start with the room and then... Uh... Proceed to online. Hi, uh, David Carr, BEG Torah. Um, terrific work, Tody. It's very interesting. I'll start with a comment, then I do have a question. Um, in Torah, we're, we started base and scale. We started with logs. Now we're working the other way back. And so we've sort of been using an order of magnitude more data and that more wells, but 
we suffer from having an order of magnitude less sophisticated, less detailed rock data like you've got. So I totally applaud what you're doing because that's the, the two things need to meet and you're obviously going in that direction. So love the work that you're doing. It's humbling to see it compared to what I'm doing. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, I've got a question regarding your pinstripe faces. Um, very interesting faces. Uh, it, it's very VARB-like. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of talk and, and uh, uh, hypotheses about Aeolian uh, influence in that there, there are a lot of windblown dust that more than likely fell in the Permian Basin and then was reworked. Do you think that has any seasonality? Well, what, what, do, do you have any hypotheses on, on how that yeah, facing is formed? That's a good question. I think, you know, with the Aeolian side, you know, certainly the source of the grains uh, are most likely Aeolian. And if you look at the, the grain size distribution within that pinstripe facies is really consistent. You know, it's pinned at basically 32 micron grain size, you know, plus or minus five micron. It's, I'm lying a little bit, but it's it's a very fine uh, silt size and it's a very, um, very consistent across the board. So I think the um, the source certainly can be uh, Aeolian. The varve nature of it, that's sort of alternating from quartz rich to the laminations, that's pretty complicated. And we Rob Reed is doing a lot of SEM work right now to actually try to understand what the um, those laminations are. And some of them are clay, a lot of them are organics. And so whether or not that's, um, I think it was Luigi actually that started the, the whole idea of the, um, that these are varved. Um, I don't know if they're varved. They're, I think there's evidence of reworking. So is it an alien system that got deposited and then it got reworked? Um, I'm gonna kind of hold my interpretation for that. A nice talk, I have one question. Yeah, when I listen to you, yeah, very interesting things. You are talking about up, upscale, but my understanding, I talk basically upscale from very, very small scale to yeah. No, it's a great question. To the one analog scale, right? Yeah. But interesting to me is uh, how do you how do you do it from from here further to seismic scale? Yeah, like uh, ten to twenty meters. Right. Mauricio is here uh, right now to uh, very, to very important for the seismic interpretation. Well, it's important for the seismic interpretation, but it's also important for the geocellular models. You know, we're yeah. we're at this two inch scale, which is just it's it's not a reasonable scale to try to. So, do we have an idea how to do that already? We've tried a few. I mean, so there's there's one inherent upscaling that's happening, and it's it's not a true upscaling, but it's a um. If you look at the difference between the um. There's an upscaling that's already happening through the, the prediction with the wireline, because the wireline just doesn't have that, um, that capability for um, uh, distinguishing some of these real thin bed heterogeneities. And so the nature of losing some of that thin bed is, is helping in that upscaling part. How you upscale a discrete lithological unit is like that, I think I, we had a meeting uh, this, earlier this week and I think we called it the $10 million question. Like, how do you, how do you take a thin bed next to another thin bed and if they're very different how do you average that out um we, we're trying a few things I'll, I'll leave the company nameless at this point but we're trying a few things to take the um can we just can we take a one foot interval and can we take the facies that's the the most abundant call it that can we go back and look at you know i, I made this point in here and i think there might be something to to this when the facies are being predicted it's actually it's the probability that it's FACs. And so there might be some information in that, that probability data that we can use to say, well, shoot, hold on. This, you know, this is 90% probability it's FACs one. The one right below it, it's a 50% probability it's FACs one. You know, can you make some sort of decision that at what point you'll just call it the other, you don't have to always go with the, the highest probability FACs. Maybe the second probability FACs is way. I don't know, I'm mumbling on the answer because I don't know exactly how to do it. I guess the logic is probably similar. Yeah, you probably took the most uh, dominant faces to upgrade it, upscale. Yeah, you know, another way to say it is not do it. So if <laughs> so, no, that that flies in the face of building geocellular models. Obviously, if you're going to build a geocellular model, then you have to figure out how to upscale these discrete measurements. 
But if the goal is to build out really high resolution um, porosity curves, you don't have to upscale that. We can convert all this high resolution um, facies data that we've got, just, you know, and then just plot the, the, the porosity for each of those facies and build out better high resolution curves. So in that way, you can at least turn the discrete facies data into a curve. All right. Um, I don't know if you have access to production data, but if you do, have you been able to find correlations between your chemo phases and your production? Or do you think you might be missing some important factors like fractures? Yeah, no, there's like a scaling, there's a scaling question, <laughs> a hidden scaling question. Um, I've not tied this directly to production data. Um, usually that that's the sort of uh, the, the handoff that we have between the work we do and the operators that, that use our results. Um, so no, I've not incorporated production data directly into this. Hey, Dodi, good talk. Uh, one question about the uh, Y-line um, integration. So you use triple, triple combo, right? That include bulk, gamma, and resistivity. And neutron porosity. And neutron, and resistivity is mostly controlled by saturation. Right. And in your, so my question is, have you considered consider, uh, consider saturation? Well, based on my understanding is based on XIF chemophysis, right? And co-examination. So my question is, how, 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 how good do you think the resistivity can help to, you know, in, in your wireline log um, application? Yeah, no, that's and a great another question. another thing okay. is, yes. So it might be, you know, I mean, if you remove that resistivity, how, how, how different do you think that result would be? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it's, a, it's, it's almost like the dirty secret of the, of, the Delaware, of the Permian Basin is that the resistivity curves track fluid, right? It's porosity and fluid. <clears throat> but we, get, we build up, I mean, I think most of us that have built out stratigraphic stacking patterns across the Permian Basin have relied heavily on on resistivity curves, so they're they're clearly you know reflecting something in the um in the in the lithophases. The um the idea behind putting in the resistivity curve was that you know it, it number one gives us a larger data set, number two the formations do respond to the resistivity curve, and so we know there's a connection between the the facies and the resistivity. The warning though, and I think this is an important one that that you know you might be bringing up is that if the fluid saturations are going to change significantly across the basin and you've got one wireline log model and you're extending it, you know, really long distances and the fluid saturations change, that's going to absolutely affect the results from the model. And I think that's, you know, when I was mentioning this, this issue we're having, like, you know, we have cord intervals across the basin. And so we can run the model, you know, off one wireline model, and then we can validate it off other cord intervals where we see it failing, that's the first question I've got. Is it is it failing because of a change in the fluid chemistry across that part of the basin? Or is it really a facey shift? And so it's it's working surprisingly well long distances across the um the Delaware basin. In the um in the Eagleford when we're running this and in the Austin Chalk and actually let me start with the Austin Chalk. When we're running it in the Austin Chalk, we're getting considerable shifts in the um and I think that's in part because we're running a model of from the you know from the oil window down into the gas window, and you can see where this thing's starting to fall apart. And so I think that's going to be an example of where we're going to want to pull the resistivity model out and rely on other curves. No, that's a good question. Um, I was going to comment on that. I'm calculating facies with a much more simplistic um, method in the Delaware and Midland Basin, um, using just gamma ray and resistivity and a simple cross plot, and it works pretty darn well. And it's not nearly as good as what Tody's doing, but you know, on a base and scale, it works. And my theory or hypothesis is that the reason it works at all with the resistivity in the Permian Basin is the porosities are so low ev everywhere. So, yeah, where you've got porous permeable sands, and and there are obviously salinity differences in in water um, from place to place, but. But because of the, you're, you're almost fortunate that the porosity 
uh, is is so low in terms of predicting facies with uh, using resistivity. So. Uh, well, very nice summary of all the work we've been doing. Totally, uh, in more than questions is uh, perhaps comments. One, one is: Are we have some plans to include the second one, second ones, on this analysis in the future? Because we we are targeting that now. Yeah, uh, it will be good to to add to this uh, stratigraphic framework. And if you go to your north south cross section that is hanging to the to the top of the uh, uh, I think it was a X Y one, yeah. one of those. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's where I this, this helped me to understand quite a bit a lot now. In the right at the top where you have hung it, the, this cross section we have a pressure ramp up, so you go from normal gradient all the way to to uh, over pressure in all the blue faces that you have displayed there, and I don't see a clear seal that is actually sealing the pressure and. And now looking at this, I and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it's just a matter of pressure equalization due to the uh, uh, permeability in the system. You have more permeable. All your yellow on the top is normally pressure, and then go into these blues where you have a, a abnormal pressure or higher pressures there. The pressure just has been kept because of the porosity and perm in that system is low right do you yeah, think that's and again, a good assumption or not yeah so uh, is what you're talking so you're seeing a compartmentalization of pressures so higher pressures in um in the x and y sands all the way from the top the x y sands to to all the wolf camps over pressure is over pressured yeah. and you're seeing a you're seeing a lower pressure in the in the siltstones in the third sand yeah so observation wise from the core <clears throat> these calcareous mudstones do look like well they, they first off they do have lower permeability um and they're thicker intervals. And so they have a very different appearance than you find in these sort of um, the green colored, the argillaceous siliceous siltstones here. And so looking at it, I mean, I wouldn't expect that these uh, mudstones on above this kind of lower bench of the third sand would have the ability to constrain pressure. But, you know, depending on the thickness, and we can look back at some of the chord intervals for the, the actual thickness of these. Um, let me see if we can get that from this. If I put a scale in here, um, no, nah, that scale is going to be too. Yeah, I think these mudstones on top of the um, on top of the uh, X and on top of the Y, you know, those can those can be thirty to fifty feet in the thickness. I'd have to go back and check that number for sure. But yeah, you're essentially talking about a, these two mudstones uh, providing a seal of sorts for pressure. Yeah. Yeah, actually, actually that is the, the one of the question I also wanted to follow up is actually you bring that here. It's uh, you know, X Y it's it's actually right. Extra sun is relatively thin, but uh, interbedded with uh, organic rich shells. Those those could be serve as seal or also serve as source rock. Mm -hmm. And for yeah. all generator oil and gas can be short short migration and charged into the the, the X Y sunstones. And uh, so, if you see the some uh, overpressure in X Y, I'm not really surprised because. It's relatively, relatively good seal and soft rock system combined together. But the, it's, I really wonder how about third bone spring sunstones, how their pressure looks like. Mm -hmm. It's normal. It's normal, yeah. yeah. It's actually the. Pressure ramps, if I invite the big top, what's the wolf camp start to ramp up? Mm -hmm. It goes higher and higher. And yeah, yeah. It's also showing the faces, this organic rich, rich faces are in the wolf camp. Yeah. Which makes sense because once you start to release oil, like the crude oil is trapped in the, in the core system and pressure starts to, it starts to grow, right? So that's what I think. Well, anyway, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. no, that's yeah, yeah. you're seeing that too. Like the 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 dark rays here, these faces, these are going to be the most organic, uh, yeah. organic matter rich. Yeah. 
<clears throat> okay, well, I think we're kind of pushing the limit here. I think this conversation could go on for another couple of hours. It looks like there may be a question online. Michael, can you see if if, if there's something there? Yeah, sure. I can. Can you pull up the chat? My. I don't know if I should open. I got a lot of direct questions. Oh, no, I guess let me, uh, why don't you ask it? There's a few direct questions on there. Might not want to put on the screen. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah. In a good way. <laughs> so, well, we're, we're, we're kind of pushing the time. So yeah. maybe uh, they can well, contact let me, you. Actually, well, let's just stop share and then um, see, do it that way. Where does, uh, Chat. Here we go. Yeah, these are pretty long questions. I'll get back. I tell you what, what I'll do is I'll get back. I'll, I'll copy these and um, yeah, maybe you can contact them directly. Yeah, and, and so I think with that, uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Larson for a great talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming.